in Rex Corner. Today I have Mike Torsha, who I've known for many, many years, probably about 35 years. Uh, he used to train down in Venice back in the golden era with me, and he's taken his career and he boosted it to high levels, and he's an awesome guy, and he's in great shape, and he's smart as a whip, and he knows where fitness is, and he's the guy that's going to explain to you what he's done with his life and where it's going. So it's really cool that I have him here. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so we're going to get into this right now. So we, we went into the, you went into the gym. Did you expect it to look like that? Not at all. What did you think it was going to look like? Well, I thought it was going to be some huge place because in the magazines they made it look like it was a massive gym. It was very, very small. Yeah. And it had the same kind of old equipment similar to what I was training at with the YMCA. A little more organized. Yeah. Yeah. What was your impression? Because I know how I felt when I walked in. I started Bill Pearls. And then I, a year later, I went to Golds, and I didn't even know what Golds was. I never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. But what was your impression when you started seeing these guys? You know, like you see Draper and you see Collard, uh, you know, Roger Collard and people like that. It was like a whole different world, huh? It was like being in the magazine. Yeah. I mean, I, I only saw these people in the magazines, and I followed every month the workouts that were featured. Yeah. To so see Arnold and see Franco and seeing Ken Waller and Bob Birdsong and Bill Grant. Yeah. Oh, it, it was amazing. And they were so kind to me. They were respectful. And they said, come on, kid, let me show you what to do. I didn't know what to expect as far as them greeting me because I thought, of course, they were like not going to help me. Yeah. But I could watch. They actually invited me to train with them. Yeah, it was really a good group of people. Yeah. And the thing was, they invited me. I mean, here I am, 15 years old. Yeah. Come on, let's go. Let's go to the Germans. Remember yeah, the Germans? Oh, sure. And we'd get these huge omelets, and I could barely finish half. For $1.35. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it right. was great. Yeah, it's, it was a camaraderie that you don't find today. A lot of people write into me about the days in the 70s. It was a group of guys just hung together. It was just like being in high school. Yeah. You know, your high school buddies. And you could go there any time of the day or night, and someone would be around that you know. So you always had someone to hang out with. So you're never really lonely or by yourself. Yeah, and I like the fact that, you know, people worked out. Like yeah. Buddies. Yeah. Instead of having trainers, they just had workout buddies. Yeah, there were no trainers. Yeah. Except for Zabo. Yeah. Yeah. That's he true. was only, he trained Elvis. Did he really? Yeah, he, really? he'd go down to like Monty Steakhouse in Westwood, and I guess in the basement there was a gym. He'd train at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh -huh. When Isaac Hayes came in the gym and some people like that, but there were no trainers. But now, when you got to that level, did you change your training? When you went to that gym, did you train your diet? Did you change your diet and your training? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I remember going uh, to dinner with Arnold. Yeah. And uh, I ordered a cheeseburger and fries, <laughs> and I was putting all this ketchup. And he just looked at me. He called me the little Kroger. Yeah. And he just told me that you know. You, the ketchup is very bad for you. Yeah. And the fries are very bad for you. But the burger meat, the meat was good. I'm glad you said that because I do have a theory about that. Every once in a while I go to In-N-Out. Once every six months. And I get a three by three and, and, and my girlfriend says, isn't that fattening? I said, not really. I said, you got, they have fresh meat. You have lettuce and tomato. You have a little cheese. Yeah, you have a little bit of dressing on there, not much. And then you have six grams of bread. Big deal. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Once in a while, right? Yeah, of course. I can do well, that. Well, you know, what he made me do was realize that when I ordered the burger, yeah. instead of the fries, he told me to get cottage cheese. It's got calcium, it's got protein, it builds your bones. That's what I do. Because you got to remember, I was 15 years old, right. and I was growing. So he wanted me to grow. He wasn't worried about me having perfect abs. At the okay. time. I was at 15 looking to put on solid muscle. So at that time, of course, he encouraged the beef and the cottage cheese, and he said salad. You know, vegetables. Okay. But he said salad, I don't mean rabbit food. Lettuce is rabbit food. Right. Peppers, cucumbers, you know, radishes. He said those are vegetables. Right. Most people get lettuce and tomato, and it's nothing but rabbit food. Worthless. Uh, it is. It's food. worthless. Yeah. It is rabbit. So he made me, in simple ways, understand proper nutrition yeah. for the fundamentals of bodybuilding. Right. And then it evolved. Because then when they saw that I wanted to get in competition. Yeah. Then they are like Franco was really adamant about teaching me to superset, triset, giant set. So did Arnold, and also the nutrition and sprinting. Mm -hmm. We didn't do cardio. We just no, did there was no cardio. sets. Right. And then three weeks before our show, yeah. I was sprinting every other day. We're on the beach. On the beach. Yeah. Where Muscle Beach is. Well, right. actually, where it's near where Muscle Beach they say was because right. you know they moved that. Right. As you know. But yeah, the sprinting was what I was doing in the in the sand, and I got shredded. Oh, I'm sure. But it was mostly the diet. 
as a diet. Spring helps. I mean, it does, but it, uh, the diet was key to everything, and then the supersets as well, but yeah. without overtraining. Exactly. Wow. Gotta get your rest. I remember training with um, Mike and Ray Mensar, and that was an experience that I only did a few times because it wasn't an enjoyable way to train. Yeah. And that's what actually Arnold said to me. Because he asked me, he said, how did you like that? I said, I enjoy the way you train. He goes, me too. Yeah. Because he said, it's like taking a, a road to, to go a certain way. Some people will take the, like, the four or five, or some people will take the Sepulveda. And he goes, I like to take the Sepulveda. Mike likes to take the four or five. Fasten. That's the whole key. Yeah. Everybody wants a shortcut. They want the fast track to something. And a lot of guys don't realize drugs they think is the fast track it's really not no it only enhances what you're already doing right if your diet's clean your and your workouts are clean and you're going to compete you're going to get that little fine edge that's about the only time it comes in well i really found that a lot of people that did take drugs yeah but didn't train hard didn't yeah. eat right went nowhere yeah and the only time of what i know from watching the pros right was they trained hard all year round right they had their period of time when they would take a break and and train less and loosen up on the diet. Right. But for the most part, they were always training consistently hard and eating well balanced meals. And when it came close to preparing for a show, they had different phases, which would mean then reduce the calories and pick up the training and add the uh, sprinting. Yeah. You know say. But it was only eight, ten weeks they would go into a cycle for the show. Now it's year round. Well, you've got, a lot of guys go year round. They don't watch their diets. They've got pimples all over them. They're fat. And, and, and even the stuff they're taking today, if they get the black market, you don't even know if it's real. Right. That's the other part problem. And I'll tell you, I was at the LA Fitness Expo this weekend. Yeah. And I saw a lot of the pros that I would see in the magazine all year round that were soft and bloated, had used stomachs, and they just looked horrible. Yeah. And I just said to myself, that totally goes against why I worked out, why I first started into bodybuilding. How could you just look a certain way for a show and the rest of the year just be overweight and sloppy and uncomfortable? Well, back then it was a lifestyle. You wanted to look good all year round. It was a health, healthy lifestyle. It wasn't about getting big and getting smaller. It was about staying in shape. Yeah. And most people don't. They don't. The pros, they don't do that. They, like you say, they get heavy and then they train down. Everything you gain, you have to lose. And it's a job. Well, I feel the old school bodybuilders look much better. I do too. Harder. Right. They didn't have the distended abdominal walls. They had more pleasing physique. Exactly. And they were harder looking. Well, back in the days, the, the, the ideal physique was broad shoulders, small waist. That's where we strive. We're starting with Steve Reed. All right. So you competed then? Yeah, I competed in the uh, Teenage Mister uh, New York State and won. Okay. And then I competed in the Teenage Mister America in 1976 and I won that. Okay. And then I, uh, the following year, I competed in the Mister Collegiate USA and I won that. Yeah. And I was just on a roll, you yeah. know, and I was going, I won the Southern States and Atlantic States, and I just kept winning show after show after show. Mm -hmm. Well, what I would do is every summer, I would go out to California mm -hmm. and train with Arnold and Franco and, and Bill Grant and Bob Birdsong. Mm -hmm. So it was like my schooling. Right. And then they'd go over my posing, they'd go over how I could advance to improve my weak points. And my quads started getting too big, so then they said, Less quads, focus on the hamstrings, work on the calves, because it, it's well, symmetry. You know, right. symmetry, right. You know, most of the time people just want to get big. Right. Yeah. It's, there's a huge difference between that. Um, what was your, in your mind, in your competing, what was your goal as far as outside the contest to take your career and do what you want to do to make a living? Well, it all goes back to when I first started working out. I was 14 years old. I was in my basement. I was doing bench presses, and my father came down, and he goes, what the hell are you doing? And I said, I'm working out. He goes, what's that going to do? Is I going to put food on the table? <laughs> it sounds so familiar. He goes, how are you going to make a living? I said, yeah. I'm going to teach people, and I can get paid to teach people. He goes, ah, come on. He's going to take over my business, the landscaping business, mm -hmm. and you're going to provide a good living, you're going to have a family, and you're going to take over my business. You can't make a living as a gym bum. That's all you'll be. So I said, you'll see, I'll show you. I'm going to find a way to make a living being a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I did. Yes, you did. And, and there's a few, a handful of people that did. Uh, but for the most part, when you look around, a lot of the guys today, they don't. You know, the top guys can make some money and endorsements and that. But the ones that, that just train every day, they have to have a full-time job. They have to do something else. Well, 
the good thing was, you know, what's so funny was when I was 17, my mother goes, look, you got all these people calling the house. They're asking for workout programs, diets. So why don't we do this? We'll put some flyers up in, over by the butcher, in the vegetable store, in the fish store, and tell people $5 for a workout, $5 for a diet. And sure enough, I was making some good money at 17. But she's the one who came up with the idea, teach people. Mm -hmm. And they pay you a fee, mm -hmm. and that's when it first started. Mm -hmm. Of course, I charge a lot more now than. Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's getting your feet off the ground. Yeah. But my mom was the one that gave me the direction, yeah. gave me a little bit of nudge. And in fact, my brother-in-law was uh, attending West Point, and uh, he ended up being retiring as a colonel in the army. So I would go in the summertime before I'd go to California for two weeks and work with the strength conditioning coaches and go through their training principles to build a foundation besides what I was learning in bodybuilding with the pros when I was coming out to Venice. And that's where I came up with my, my company, Operation Fitness. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And my mom said, yeah, that's a perfect name. So I registered, registered domain, operationfitness.com. And I built it out first as a military style program. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that doesn't work for everybody. Right. And then I fine tuned my program. And now I have everything from kids fitness to weight loss for women to senior programs. I work even with the disabled. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you're worldwide with this now. Oh much. yeah. Yeah. I take it worldwide. Yeah. And I'm really happy because bodybuilding is what really gave me the foundation. That is the foundation yeah. for it. And it just for everything. Means, yeah, it is. It is for everything. And also to have the drive to do something. If you have the drive in the gym to do something, you can do the drive outside the gym. Yeah, I mean, especially, you know, when I was a fat kid and I was, I never had any self-discipline. And I was a loner. And I liked the sport. Mm -hmm. It was about me. And if I failed, I failed because of me. And if I won, it's because of me. I'm not relying on anybody else. What do you think, and, and I'm asking this of, of guys, older guys, I get a lot of emails from guys, I'm 70, and I get a lot of emails from guys late 50s, 60s, and 70s, who have trained in the past, they want to train again, they have injuries, they don't respond like they used to, and they don't know what to do. What do you suggest well, to someone? It's, it's so common, because the problem is, people have that automatic pilot that they go to, mm -hmm. and think they can just pick up when they were younger, right. that young buck and training really hard. Yeah. And they can't. They have to ease into it because right. you know how our muscles are now. Right. Before you can jump into a workout, and most likely if you start off light and started getting to the workout sensibly, you'd be okay. Now you really have to warm up the muscles, yeah. and you also have to be careful of not overstretching, not bouncing, not using poor form and technique. And heavy weights. And heavy weights, and also you've got to understand what's going on with your body. Like for instance. With my company, I make sure that any client that comes to us first has blood work done. So we know if they're 50 years old, okay, what's your testosterone? What's your estrogen level? What's your thyroid production? Mm -hmm. What's going on with your overall metabolism, digestive tract? Okay. Then we design a meal plan. Then we design a workout. But we also take into consideration the evaluation of their structure. They may have a bad knee, a slight tear in the rotator. Mm -hmm. And then we have to address that first because you can't push if someone has a problem with their knee, their hip, their shoulder, their neck. Certain so, things they can't do. Exactly. When I trained Kevin Spacey for American Beauty, yeah. he had two bad knees, bad lower back and a bad neck. First thing I had to do was I had to spend at least uh, eight to ten weeks just rehabbing him mm -hmm. because he could barely walk on a treadmill without being in pain within six minutes. Oh, my God. Yeah, so it's a process, but you have to adapt and adjust to what your physical capabilities are and what your goals are. Because when maybe when you're 20, you were looking to put on a small muscle mass. Now maybe at 50, you're looking to just stay lean, exactly. healthy, and be pain-free or have less pain. Yeah, you know, people say, oh, you were so bigger when you were, so much bigger when you were younger. I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's, now is the time to stay lean and hard and make sure your joints are okay and you feel good because you can't maintain that. Yeah, well, it's our just, priorities change. Yeah, our priorities course. change. And it's like I go on a gym, I work out 40 minutes, and I'm done, right? It's been an hour and a half. And I'm done. I'm tired. I don't yeah. do anymore. You know what's so funny was um, I was, when I was walking around the LA Fitness Expo, um, there was one of the exhibitors that was giving out shirts. And he said, would you like a shirt? And I said, sure. So he goes, what size are you? Medium. <laughs> so I had a flashback because it was either 
XL or double XL. So when he said, what size are you, medium, I go, boy, am I getting old. Oh, I know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know, I know. <laughs> it, it makes a difference. Although some of the big guys that I've had on here, I'm talking, and you know they are big guys, 300 pounders, will come in here to put on a medium tank top to look bigger. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Wow. I know. It, it shocks me. Um, I had one certain person put on a double X shirt. He says, I don't look good in t-shirts. I got to wear tank tops. I don't have that mindset. Yeah. My mom says, oh, you look so good in a nice V-neck. It's a little tight. I said, no, I like it loose. I don't know. I don't need to show it off. Yeah, that's good. I want to feel comfortable. So now what you're doing, where can people find you and what are you promoting right now? Well, I got a couple of things going on right now. With okay. me. It's like when Jack, right before Jack Lane passed away, mm -hmm. he told me his campaign to shape up America was the most important thing in his life, throughout yeah. his life. Yeah. So I launched the Shape Up America campaign in 2001 on behalf of Jack, mm -hmm. and I told him that I was going to continue on his work across the country, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to be, you know, pulling boats, yeah. being shackled and things like yeah, that. Yeah, only he did that. Yeah. And he, in fact, I asked him, I said, why did you do that? And he goes, well, because we didn't have Twitter or Facebook. He goes, if we had social media, I wouldn't have to draw, draw, draw everybody's attention and do extreme things. But he goes, because uh, he had a lot of injuries from all that, his yeah. rotator cuff, his back, so on. But uh, so I started this campaign and I partnered with NBC, the network, and we put on events across the year. We have, we just had Washington DC, we had 98,000 people show up over two days. Um, we have an upcoming event in Baltimore. Uh, we also have one in Boston. We have one in Tennessee. We have one in Fort Lauderdale. So we're doing events across the country, usually about six or seven events a year. We get tens of thousands of people, but it's a heart of America. Yeah. It's average yeah. Americans that yeah. need help. Yeah. It's not like the Arnold classic. No, no, it's everyday joke. Yeah, exactly. And right. that's where I feel we're giving back to America. Right. And then I have my Operation Fitness, right. where people come if they want a trainer, they want a gym design, they want a wellness program. I also provide pet fitness. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. It's a big, and it's a big, big demand. It's amazing, which I love. Because I'm an animal lover, and I can see as you are yeah, too. Yeah, with your dog. I'm an animal lover. I have born a house. You haven't seen. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's wonderful. So the, the websites are up. Yeah, um, yeah. It's operationfitness.com okay. and elitehealthconcierge.com. Okay. And that is a more of an upscale program where I provide health and fitness professionals to people around the world. I have trainers in 11 countries right now. Oh my God, that's huge. I have chefs that I send around the world, orthopedic surgeons. That's huge. Nutrition. Yeah, it's, it's big. Good yeah. for you. Thank you. You look awesome. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, you look great yourself. I'm trying. I'm trying. You know, I'm hanging in there through all the injuries of wrestling. All. It's not easy. But uh, I get up every day and I do my thing and just keep going. Well, you were, I want to say, you were always a big inspiration because I used to see you always pumping and goals. I and still do. You know, and, I, and sometimes my kids say, you, don't, you need to know when to stop because I still train hard. I don't know how not to train hard. I don't know how to go in there and do a light workout. Yeah. It doesn't set well in my head. And then when I leave, I go have my coffee at Starbucks to relax a little bit, make sure I have my nutrition, I have my rest. Yeah. But the body hurts. It yeah. just does. It's part of life. Exactly. You know, we're all going to be growing older and have aches and pains, and yeah. we just have to deal with it because our pain threshold is a lot better for us now because we used to train so hard. Right. We're used to the pain anyway. Right. But I also talk to younger guys that have the same pain. They can be 30 years younger than me. They have bad shoulders and knees hurt backwards. It's the same deal. I'm just older than them. <laughs> That's what it is. Thank you so much for being on here. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, you guys are going to love this interview. And uh, I, I might have you back for something else. Doing some other things. Okay. Thank you guys for watching Rick's Corner. And stay tuned for more. I'll be bringing more your way soon. It's RickDrayson.com. He is the equalizer, baby. See you next time.